Jeremy, a big day. So many people shocked by this guilty verdict. So I'd like to know first what your thoughts are. Uh, I mean, I think I'm surprised like everybody else. Uh, I was thinking there might be a little longer of a deliberation, um, but you had 10 hours is not nothing. You had 22 witnesses. You had, I think, over 200 exhibits, uh, almost five weeks of trial. Uh, so um, we'll, we'll hear what the jury has to say in the, in the coming days. Uh, but it looks like at the outset, obviously, the, the prosecution kind of in their, their, their whole strategy was what I characterized as a paper cut strategy. They had, again, 22 witnesses. 21 of them were not named Michael Cohen, right? Uh, and, and Donald Trump and his team were not able to really land any square blows against some of the other ones. The whole concept of the prosecution's case was to corroborate, corroborate, corroborate Cohen. Uh, and, and so obviously the jury, it sounds like that, that that was an effective strategy. Now we go into a sentencing phase uh, that's set for July the 11th, I think, uh, from I'm, I'm sure has already been reported. Uh, but uh, we'll we'll see what happens here. The judge has a number of things uh, that that he can utilize for sentencing. Uh, New York State requires by law that a pre-sentence investigation be done. Uh, that's a, an area where the 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 prosecution can file uh, something with the with the court. Uh, Donald Trump's lawyers can file something with the court, and I believe you're going to see that the court officers, the probation department, also has a say in there as well. And we'll see what happens on the 11th. Before we continue on to see what's going to happen between now and July 11th, of course, there's going to be an appeal also filed by Trump's lawyers. But even before that, let's break down some more of what we had today, because you even just said it. Almost 10 hours of deliberation, that's not a long time, especially for this weeks-long trial. What did the defense do wrong for the jury to come up with this verdict so quickly? Um, I, I mean... That, that you've got to, a, a, the, the, when you defend a case with what, what you might call a reasonable doubt defense, that's where saying they didn't prove it, they didn't prove it, they didn't prove it. The law says that, and, and we know inherently that the prosecution has to prove it, but it's got to mean something to the jury. And, and the way you get, have to give it some meaning is that you have to, you have to give it some context and you have to, you have to inject some alternate theories into the case. So if we're pointing at things and if we're looking at things that the defense didn't do, I, I didn't really hear in this trial a cogent counter theory. Now, again, the law doesn't require it. The burden doesn't shift. But jurors are people. They're emotional. And they want to hear, OK, the, the $100 question is, was Michael Cohen lying? The million-dollar question is why, right? Um, what and, and, and I don't know that we heard anything more advanced than maybe some one-liners. They called Michael Cohen the gloat, the greatest liar of all time. I, I mean, that's sticky stuff and it's decent trial advocacy. But if there was an overarching theory that they had, I guess that didn't really connect. You could argue that uh, Michael Cohen, that this entire thing was a theft scheme by Michael Cohen, right? Michael Cohen felt cheated by Donald Trump. He, he felt like he had been screwed by him. Uh, he felt like he had been owed money. So how does Michael Cohen do it? Well, he constructs this this thing where he's going to have a cash payment, set up this this sham company, and then extract his money that way, all trying to hide it from Donald Trump because he was trying to steal. That would be a theory. That would be something that that uh, that the jury could latch on to and 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 sort of grip. So you've got the prosecution in the case that told a cogent tale. We had a campaign in disarray. Uh, we had a campaign that was afraid of everything just going just going completely south in October of 2016. Then they followed the money trail, and then they followed it up with Cohen. So the defense, again, just in in, in the the law doesn't require the defense to come up with a counter strategy, uh, a counter a countervailing theory, but you have to inject those alternative theories for the jury to really chew on them in a meaningful way. You know, something that's so interesting is that the presiding judge, Juan Mershon, he limited so many references when it came to Michael Cohen and his previous guilty pleas. And yet this entire trial, as you just mentioned, was centered around what happened with Michael Cohen. How, please, if you can just break it down for our viewers, explain to us how attorneys were able to get around that and why the judge didn't crack down harder when it came to all of those arguments. 
Um, when it comes to uh, Michael Cohen, right, you, you've got to, when you're the trial judge, you, you do have to kind of keep train, uh, things on track, right? And you have to kind of keep the, the, the train going in a certain direction. Um, in a case like this, the defense is almost certainly going to put the other guy on trial, right? You're going to put Michael Cohen on trial. When you have a case that has a snitch on it, right, the snitch is the one that goes on trial. And in, in the closing arguments, the prosecution comes back and they argue um, this case is not about Michael Cohen. This case is about Donald Trump. And so so what, what can happen is when you start digging into somebody like Michael Cohen, right? I mean, there's fair and then there's fair. There's his plea to, to uh, uh, tax fraud. There's pleading guilty to wire fraud. There's pleading guilty to perjury. There's pleading guilty to this case, right? And then you can get on and on and on. And eventually you're talking about his fourth grade dental reports. And the judge may at some point say, okay, 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 we're not going to go, we're not going to dig quite that deep, right? Because again, the issue is Donald Trump and the issue is the 34 counts that he's charged with, right? That's, that's the germane part of this. So the trial judge does have a lot of discretion to sort of limit those, those, those sort of issues there. Um, and, and Todd Blanche, the, the defense lawyer, I mean, he was able to extract out of Michael Cohen that there was theft and that that theft was germane to the transaction in this case. Uh, again, if I'm the defense lawyer, that's my argument. Uh, again, because we, we have to give it the why. The, the 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 fact that Cohen is just got a terrible reputation, the fact that he stole, again, that's the hundred dollar question. But we got to answer that million dollar question. Why would Michael Cohen construct all of these transactions, do all of these things and intentionally hide it from the boss? And that was just a theory that that I don't know that ever resonated or landed at home for the jury. We've talked about Michael Cohen, the former president, and also the judge that was assigned to this case. Someone we haven't touched on, though, is Stormy Daniels, who is really at the center of this entire trial. Those payments uh, allegedly made to her will now were made to her and uh, the president convicted in those charges. So where does she fit into this picture? What comes next for her? I, like, that's really the question, I guess. Where does she fit? Probably a book deal. Probably a book deal. Uh, probably some uh, some interviews and 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 some FaceTime. I mean, she was she was a person that I don't know that they needed to call as a witness in this case. Um, and that would go back again. Another instance of the judge saying, "Okay, enough," uh, because they were uh, the, the the prosecution's theory was, "Well, we have to call Stormy Daniels because this is what the." This is what American voters would have heard, and we have to show the jury what was hidden. I think it was just kind of an excuse for them to, to, to sort of spice things up. They had had two weeks' worth of accountants and CPAs and, and money people, and, I mean, you throw a porn star up there, and, and then they start talking about sex, and the jury perks up, right? And then you have an explosive day or two of court with Stormy Daniels there. Uh, but I don't know that it was particularly relevant, and I don't know that it, that it did much of anything. That said, um, uh, President Trump has consistently denied any kind of relationship with her. I don't think any of us care. And I don't know that the jury cared either. And from a trial advocacy standpoint, again, when we go back to, to what we call kissing the ugly baby, right, marrying up to facts that hurt us, that probably would have been a good example uh, for them to come back and say, you know what, okay, fine. You know, we're, we're not going to sit here and just deny, 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 deny. Uh, we're we're going to kiss that ugly baby, but it doesn't really matter, right? I think that's probably the more effective play. Another good example of, again, kissing the ugly baby, Todd Blanche in opening statements leaned into Donald Trump's reputation for kind of being, uh, for being frugal, right? He said, why would Donald Trump pay four times the amount of money for 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 this transaction, we've all heard that 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 he's kind of actually the opposite, right? We've actually heard that uh, that 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 he's got the reputation for for being kind of tight fisted. So, um, in that instance, that would be another good example of really kind of leaning in to a bad fact and sort of turning it around for yourself. Uh, again, would have liked to see it a little more on the Stormy Daniels issue. That's where you could have made money. Um, but they were able to attack her. Uh, they were able to, I, I think, score some points with her. They were able to expose 
uh, I think some of the inconsistencies that she said, some of her motivations, I think you're going to see her on a lot of talk shows now. Uh, I think she's going to get a book deal and uh, I think she's going to do a whole lot better than that $130,000 she initially got. Okay, I want to continue on with a couple of more points, just moving through what's going to be upcoming within the next few weeks. So the appeal process. Trump's attorney is already dis announcing that he is going to appeal this verdict. What's that going to look like? How long is it going to take? And will it really change anything? Okay, so the next thing that's going to happen, obviously, are those pre-sentence investigations and those pre-sentence reports. And the judge will take that into consideration, and then the judge will sentence Donald Trump on July the 11th, or or maybe he'll just have a hearing that day, and then he'll think about it. Um, I know that's the same week of the Republican convention. I don't know if that's gonna if that's gonna play really at all. Um, but then, once the conviction becomes final, and it won't become final until Trump is sentenced, once the once the judgment is final, that is, um, then that will trigger. Trump's right to appeal. Uh, when Trump does appeal, it's going to be a very, very long process. And one thing that is possible, if not likely, is that the judge, uh, now, uh, nine out of 10 people who are charged in Manhattan with this similar offense are given probation. So it may very well be that Mr. Trump is given probation in this case, right? Not sentenced to jail, has to do community service or or something of uh, like that in in lieu of jail. Now, if he is given a prison sentence, he will still be able to file uh, to to do an appellate bond, which will allow him to be free while this case goes to um, while this case is on appeal. And that appeal could could be a couple of uh, um, could could take a couple of years. So, if Donald Trump is elected president of the United States. Uh, his case could still be up on appeal while that is happening, meaning that he would be out and about and, and running around. So um, I, I don't anticipate Mr. Trump being in prison uh, for any part of this year. I think that even if he is sentenced to jail, I think he appeals that. Um, and then that is that is stayed or paused while he is uh, while he is um, uh, running for president if he is elected. and then, if for whatever reason he's got an active sentence that's there, um, then that would be in the governor of New York's hands to potentially pardon Donald Trump if he's the president of the United States at that time, maybe for the good of the country, if, if that's what we're facing. Uh, but it's obviously unchartered stuff, for sure. It's interesting that this whole trial kind of stems from the 2016 elections and uh, trying to keep it under wraps to make sure that the former president got elected, and yet it's rearing its ugly head now when we're in another election year. And it's interesting that you mentioned this uh, concept that the president could be, uh, you know, sent to prison, not for the time being, but while, let's say, he does take over the Oval Office. I want to pull up a statement from the former president and the Truth Social Media page that he has. It says here, the real verdict is going to be November 5th by the people, and they know what happened here. And everybody knows what happened here. You have a soros bag DA and the whole thing. We didn't do a thing wrong. And it's almost crazy to even think about this, but you mentioned how New York's governor would have to pardon him in the future for the good of the country. What would that even look like? And is it a requirement for New York's governor to pardon him if we were to find ourselves in a situation where he was imprisoned? No, the governor is not required to pardon him, uh, but that would be the question, right? So let's say at, let's say Donald Trump is sentenced to jail. Now, again, that could be home confinement. Michael Cohen was given co home confinement. I would think, and again, for those reasons alone, I never, I don't see Trump actually going to a prison, even if he is given a jail sentence it would very likely be that that would be um, some type of a home confinement, if you will. And I guess the home could be the White House, right? Um, and, and they could try to navigate around that. But that would be the real political question, right? Would be, uh, would the governor of the state of New York uh, be willing to do that? Uh, so um, yeah, it's, it's again, it's strange question, strange times. Uh, to be sure with with a lot of those things. But legally, that's sort of where we are. Now, I'll give you this. 
from what I understand from the laws in Georgia, uh, for the case that he's going to be facing in Georgia, and again, I don't, I don't know that that's going to be happening before the election. The governor of Georgia does not have the power to pardon somebody who is convicted. So if, if Donald Trump is convicted in Atlanta and is given a jail sentence there, then there's really no way around that. Um, but I do think um, I do think that that's going to be a question that is going to be asked of the governor if that happens. If Donald Trump is given a probated sentence, uh, if he's put on probation, uh, then um, you're you're looking at um, uh, he he he's going to be able to be the president. He's going to be able to do what he needs to do. He's going to be able to to travel and and do all of those things. Um, and and a drawback, if you will, to probation uh, for for Judge Marchand is this. Judge Marchand issued that gag order, right? And we haven't heard anything about the gag order in about two or three weeks, but that thing became a power struggle in a football, right? Uh, because Donald Trump uh, was fairly aggressive on his social media in addressing a lot of these things um, and, and, and in many ways challenging the judge. A lot of people, uh, a lot of the talking heads that I listen to um, suggested that Trump was doing it on purpose, right? He knows every time if he goes to jail that he, raises more campaign funds out of it, right? I'm I'm a lawyer. I, I don't do politics, but I'm told that you can raise a lot of money, apparently, by by releasing a mugshot. Um, so he's challenging the judge to do that. So I think if Donald Trump is put on probation, does he challenge Judge Marchand? Do we have another power struggle? And does Judge Marchand see that coming? So uh, again, a lot of really interesting questions, but uh, July 11th is is when I don't know if that's the date that they're just going to have a hearing on it and then the judge will take it under advisement, or if that's going to be the date uh, where the jury uh, or, or where where the judge actually sentences him. I will say this: when you are found guilty of a felony, um, the judge can hold your bond insufficient and take you into custody, which did not happen today, obviously. Uh, so sometimes when somebody is found guilty of a felony. They're incarcerated right there on the spot, and then they're, they're, the sentencing happens while they're uh, in the county lockup. Jeremy Rosenthal, trial attorney, there is still so much to keep an eye out for today. We only got a guilty verdict, which seems like the biggest deal, but still, July 11th, when we're expecting to hear more from the sentencing, an appeal coming up, and uh, so much more to discuss here. But we thank you for your time, and we'll talk soon. Thank you, Carell.